Okay, so we are continuing with our discussion for Shacharit, for Shabbat. Um, last uh, couple of times we discussed uh, the, the the two first units of the morning the morning service, Birkot Shachar, <coughs> and even we got into the Korbanot and we spoke about that a little bit. Um, today we're going to start uh, Psukei de Zimra. And so we're going to open our Sidurim on page uh, 368. 368. Um, okay. So just to kind of summarize what we did, uh, what we said about the Shabbat morning tefillah, the beginning is pretty much similar to what we have every day. Meaning the first two units, the unit of, of uh, Birkot HaShachar and the unit of Korbanot is pretty much similar to what we do every day. There are trino, there are certain supplications, there are certain things that change in, in the Korbanot between Shabbat and, and of course we read the verses of the Korban uh, Musaf of, of uh, Shabbat. Okay. I'm going to say something that is uh, just reality. Most places uh, today do not really um, read the, uh, the verses of the Korbanot. So we're not going to uh, go in depth there. But it's uh, it's important to note that, therefore, the beginning of the morning tefillah is very similar to um, every day, <clears throat> in that sense. Okay, the morning blessings and all that kind of stuff. Um, here we go. There's another sidur here for you. Okay, we're page three sixty eight. We'll start with. Um, Mizmor Shechanukat Abayit LeDavid, Psalm um, thirty, which is very interesting uh, story behind that. Um, so that's the way we do it every day. Every day we start our unit of Psukei de Zimra with Psalm thirty. <coughs> However, um, there's a interesting practice. If you look actually at uh, at Sidur Nusach Sfarad, or even Sfardic Nusach, it's the same idea, you will see that this particular Mizmor uh, comes later on. It comes later on in the unit. So I'm just going to explain. Where is it? Here we go. So In Nusach Sfarad, and the Sfardic Nusach makes no difference, Mizmor Shri Chanukah Abayit David, i.e. Psalm 30, comes after Hodu. Now, Hodu, we're going to get there in a second. Hodu is not the Turkey, but it's it's uh, rather, it's the next page on page 370. Um, it's a collection of verses that we have from the Book of Chronicles. Um, it's a long paragraph. And it, those two, actually two uh, parts are part of a um, fascinating discussion in, in, in the history of, of our tefillah. So what is going on? In order to understand that, we have to look actually, um, you know, historically. So we need to understand that historically, Birkot HaShachar, I'm sorry, Psukei de Zimra, that unit of Psukei de Zimra. And what does it mean, Psukei de Zimra? Psukei de Zimra, that means psalms, psalms that serve as a preparation for the tefillah. Okay, let me break it down for a second. When the Talmud talks about tefillah, the Talmud specifically refers to the Amidah. That's the heart 
of the tefillah. So when the tongue, when you talk, when you see the word tefillah, prayer, it means amida, the Shmona Esre. That's number one. We have a separate independent mitzvah, which is the Shema. Right? Based on the Pasuk of Shokbechav Komecha, we have twice a day we have the obligation to recite the Shema. Okay, so in the beginning it was only the first paragraph, later on we added the second paragraph, the third paragraph, whatever. The difference between our practice and reform practice when it comes to the third paragraph doesn't matter. Second paragraph and the third paragraph. We're going to get there, we're going to discuss it in, at length. But that's an independent mitzvah. Okay, to recite the Shema. Now, what happens? The rabbi is already in the, before the times of the Talmud, already at the times of Knesset Agdola, decided to wrap that unit of the Shema with blessings. Okay, this is a practice that we see in many, many other places. We have, for example, Hallel, right? So Hallel is a biblical passage, passages, <laughs> that has a bracha before and a bracha after, right? The Shema is, therefore, is similar way. It's a biblical passage. And then we have rabbinic text, brachot, blessings before and after, etc., etc., okay? So this is a very, very ancient practice to take a biblical text and have to make it into a sandwich. You know, basically, you have rabbinic text, mainly brachot, before and after that biblical text. Now, so we have that Shema, which is an independent mitzvah, it's an obligation by itself to recite it twice a day. And the rabbis wrap it with blessings before and after. Fine. Then comes the Amidah, which is the heart of the tefillah, which the Talmud refers to as tefillah. Okay. Now, in order to be practical and realizing that, you know, to make our life a little bit easier or more difficult, if you ask other people, the rabbis decided to kind of like juxtapose and put like the whole thing together. Ah, when you do the tefillah, when you do the amida, which is the obligation for tefillah, let's juxtapose the Shema, the obligation to recite the Shema already to the Tefillah. So you come to Shul, you're going to do, you're going to kill two birds and one stone. Fine? Okay. It has, by the way, a lot of implications. We're going to discuss it in, 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 in depth when we get to that unit. Now, when you have a meal, you don't go right into the main course. I mean, sometimes you do, but yeah, generally speaking, you want to start with an appetizer. Yeah, okay, yeah, you know, there's, there's a progress, right? You go to a concert, you know, they have uh, some, like, you know, a warming band or something before the main, right? And the artist is not going to start, like, you know, with the biggest hit. There's a way to build something, right? When you read a book, there's an intro, so the rabbis understood it very, very early on that you need preparation, mental preparation in order to get to tefillah. Now think about it like in a linear way. If I have the tefillah, winning the amidah, I need some preparation. Oh, but next to it, I have the shema. Okay, so I need before the shema, some sort of a preparation, right? Fine. This is the functionality of this unit. So, the Talmud says that the people at that time, as the, the Talmud refers to the, the, the early pious ones, they used to wait, and they, trust me, they were not sitting and just like looking on their phone, um, before like a whole hour, whether it's a whole hour literally or just uh, some time, before the tefillah and after, as a kind of a mental preparation. Meditation, reading psalms, I don't know, whatever. They did something. Fine. So the rabbis started to institute this idea of preparation. How do we prepare? What does it mean to, to, to actually to prepare? 
to okay fine so that means some sort of um i need to be inspired i need to get my mind to think in a certain way whatever put uh you know other things away and focus on other things okay and how do we jews do that usually it's tehillim usually it's tehillim. if things are bad we we read tehillim if things are good we have also tehillim the hallelujahs and stuff like that that's the at least in the old days that, that, that was the practice when we need inspiration we go to tehillim why because king david who wrote most of the tehillim was able to express all the all that range of emotions and since there's so many chapters of tehillim hopefully you can find something that relates to you now can we go and do our own mental preparation and think about certain things and read other things in order to get us there? I guess, theoretically, yes. Practically, the rabbis institute those particular teilim as the formula that set us, you know, to be there. Why? Because most people can't. Most of us cannot verbalize adequately all that stuff. This is why Tfilot were started to be written. Because otherwise, before that, you just said whatever you wanted. Right? We talked about that, this tension between Keva and Kavana. Right? The, the sporadic, you know, inspirational moments in life where, you know, you just talk to God in times of challenge or in good times. And you don't need a set text. Most of the times, especially if you come to a daily minion, you need some help. <laughs> it's it's not that like you have like a clear, articulate, you know, speech in your head that you can communicate with God. You need you need the help of the sages, and this is why Tfilot started to be formulated. Okay, so we're gonna have. In this unit, bunch of Pirkei Tehillim, Psalms, that the idea behind that, that they're supposed to prepare us mentally to Tfilah. And usually that's what we do. We use the words of King David to express ourselves. But God forbid, okay, we have this practice since October 7th here in the shul, that we recite Tehillim every day in the morning and in the evening after every tefillah we recite Tehillim. Right? Because of everything that's happening in Israel. Let me ask you, what, what, why do you think we, we do that? Do you really believe that the fact that we recite Tehillim is going to make any difference? No. That's not Judaism. We don't believe in that. You know what do we believe? We believe... And unfortunately, it's not highlighted enough. We believe that that recitation of Tehillim is going to inspire us to act in a certain way. It, it enables us to express our feelings, our hopes, <clears throat> our requests from God. If we want, you know, we ask God to help the soldiers. We ask God to, be, all that kind of stuff. And what we do is, is we recite the Tehillim because it somehow expresses our feelings. But the idea is it's supposed to inspire us so we can actually use our own words. Okay? That's what... It, this is not, um, you know, some voodoo thing. Okay, say, you know, X, Y, and Z, that's a formula and that's it, it's done. We don't believe in that. Judaism is not about that. Judaism is about actions. We use Tehillim as inspiration. We use it to help us articulate for ourselves what do we want, how to ask God, what to ask. Okay, are we clear? All right. So, have that in mind. That is the function of that unit. Now, what happens in the weekday 
unit of Psukei uh, de Zimra, right? So the weekday unit is shorter than the Shabbat unit. We're going to talk about that in a second. But technically, it's a well-defined unit. You remember when I said that we have an ancient practice where we have a biblical text and we have we make it into a sandwich. We have rabbinic text before and after. Yes, I just said a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, okay, good. This is another example. We have biblical text, right? This is Tehilim, but we're going to have rabbinic text before and after. The rabbinic text is Baruch Shamar. It's going to be a blessing. And Yishtabach, which is a, the, another blessing. These are rabbinic texts that's going to define that unit of biblical text. So far, so good? Good. Now, so the unit technically, and by the way, in some old traditions, still starts with the blessing. Okay, so I come from a Yeke family, okay? And I daven in the old German Nusach, and still that German Nusach does not include, for example, that Psalm 30, we're going to talk about it in a second, because the unit's supposed to start with a rabbinic text. What is the rabbinic text? It's Baruch Shamar. It's the next paragraph. So I personally do not recite that unless I'm leading davening, and of course, then I do what the congregation is. Okay? So we have Baruch Shamar. So Baruch Shamar is the opening blessing for that unit. It's a rabbinic text. And that was the custom. That was the practice. Now, that unit, that selection of, of biblical text, Tehillim, whatever we have there, went through a lot of changes in the history. <clears throat> okay, it started with Ashrei, started with Psalm 150, and then the one before was added, and then like more, the more hallelujahs, and then we added this, and when he added it, okay, so we ended up where we ended up. Fascinating discussion when it came to this particular psalm, Psalm 30. So it is a it's 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 a later edition. It's a later edition. Fine. If you look at the Sephardic tradition, you'll see that Mizmor Shechanukat Abayat David appears after Hodu, as I mentioned. However, in Nusach Ashkenaz, as you can see. It's before the rest of the other Psalms. It's actually before the blessing of Baruch Shamar. And not only that, there's a Kaddish separating that Psalm and the Bracha. So what is going on here? Why? It was a huge debate whether to include it or not. Rabbis were debating about it for a long time. And... Finally, the compromise was, okay, we're going to add it, but in the beginning, before the bracha, because it was not originally part of the collection, and in order to show that it's not really part of the original collection, we're going to separate it. So A, it's going to be outside of the bracha, and then we're going to do a Kaddish, because the Kaddish is a separator, something that tells the Right? This is the compromise of Nusach Ashkenaz. What happened with the Spartic Nusach? Spartic Nusach Nusach. What are you talking about? The Bracha, look at the, at the next page for a second. In Baruch Shama, on page 370. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seventh line. In the middle, he said, V'sherei David Avdecha. How are we going to praise you? Right? It's called Psukei Zimra. Psukei de Zimra, songs of praise. Right? How are we going to praise you, God? With the songs of David. What do you want? This song was written by David. So why, what's the problem? Why can't we include it? And therefore, it comes after the bracha in the Sephardic Nusach. Okay. So we have another song by David. What's the problem? It belongs there. With the rest of them. With the Hallelujah. With the Ashrei. With all the, the rest of them. So it's not a problem. Ashkenazim said, no, 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 no. Originally, it was not part of there. Therefore, we're going to show that it's not. And therefore, it's outside of the bracha. It's before the bracha. 
and we're going to separate it with a Kaddish. Okay, that's the, the difference between the Ashkenaz and Sephardic Nusach when it comes to Psalm 30. So far, so good? Yes. Ah, amazing. Right. amazing. I was waiting for somebody to ask that. What's the previous what's the previous unit? You you can look at the at the weekday. It's it's not not the Birkata Shahar, it's to be more exact. No. Look at page well, Kaddish is a separator. It's not a uh, it's not a unit by itself. Okay. It's what? Look at um so Ms. Moshe, if you look at the weekday version, what? Well, learning is wide way of learning. Oh, because you made different the stuff you made. No. Yeah, oh, well that that we talked about that uh we talked about it. We talked we we had no we had we have there Elud Barim Shalam Shiu. We have a, a Mishnah there to take care of the brachot of, of, of the Birkot Torah. No, we just read Korbanot. What are the Korbanot? It's not just like reading it for fun, it's actually learning that text of the Korbanot. So remember what we talked last time? That the rabbis decided to do what we call shlish, 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 meaning like the time or whatever when you learn Torah is going to be also rabbinic texts. Remember that? Not only biblical texts, but also rabbinic texts. So therefore, if we're dealing with the rabbinic texts of the Korbanot, then what? Yeah, yeah it doesn't, it's very long. I get it. But what's going to follow is going to be a rabbinic text that relates to that. That's the Torah study, right? So the Torah study, the Torah study is the entire Korbanot is Torah study, right? So what do we have there at the at the end of there of the of the um, it's a Torah study. What that's functionality of the fact that we just study Torah. What is this <clears throat> rabbinic text that we're talking about? It's a Mishnah, for example, page forty-two, Mishnah from Zvachim that talks Ezo who mekomanchel Zvachim. Right? What is the particular location of those korbanot? How do we deal with that? Blah, 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 blah. All those mishnayot, right? It deals with the material of the korbanot. It's an expansion of those verses that we just learned, right? The verses from the Torah talks about the korbanot. Ah, fine. So now we have biblical and rabbinic text that deals with the same topic. Now we're going to be let's call it, conclude that unit, we have to do something that is kind of a summarize. So what did they choose? Look at the page page 48 at the, at the end. It's a midrash. It's a braita, right? Rabbi Ishmael says, <clears throat> through 13 rules is the Torah elucidated. That means... After reading Torah, after reading Torah, after reading the Mishnayot, after learning Torah, we need to discuss, we need to learn what are the principles by which, it's kind of a kind of, kind of a <coughs> okay, so These are the principles by which we learn Torah. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, two, thirteen. Okay. So, okay. So now we understand why that is there. So the Torah study is an outcome of the fact that we read the Korbanot. Now, what is the theme of the Korbanot? Well, the theme of the Korbanot. Korbanot. <laughs> right. The theme is the Korbanot. We discuss the sacrifices. We discuss the Beit HaMikdash. We discuss the form. All the details of that stuff. Right? That's what we just did. Now... You want me to jump from this into, into psalms of praise? I can't. If I'm really into my davening, if I'm really into my learning, if I actually mean what I say, if I connect to that text, it's impossible. Why? 
because discussing all that korbanot and all that stuff makes me realize that, oh my God, this is depressing. Because I don't have Beit HaMikdash. I cannot bring the korbanot. All that stuff is, is a huge part that is missing from our lives. Well, that led to a lot of people saying, whoa, that's depressing. That's really depressing. Now you want me to start praising God. Hey, hallelujah. No, I can't. I need a transition. I can't. What was the transition? Psalm 30. Why? Look at Psalm 30. What is the, the end? I'm just going to save you. No, no, no. You undid my sackcloth and girded me with gladness so my soul might make music so you and not be stilled. Hashem, my God, forever will I thank you. What is the background for um, for writing this uh, Tehillim, by the way? Anyone knows? Again, this is not uh, scientific. This is a uh, this is the 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 tradition. Anyone knows? No. King David. Okay, so King David has a what's called thing with Bacheva. Everybody knows the story. I don't need to explain, right? She was whatever, Mary, the, 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 the question, what, whatever. She was pregnant. They were together and then she was pregnant. What happened to that boy? Oh. No, that's the second. The first one died. And the book of Samuel tells us in details that King David, the, the boy was sick for a long time until the boy died. And we're told that King David was davening and praying and, and mourning and, and all that kind of stuff and, fi and fasting. And, and only then, after the death of, of the boy, he got up and like, you know, Yoav came to him and said like, you know, you're the king. Show must go on. You got to, you know, get yourself together. And and he did and whatever. And we'll, we'll learn a lot from, from, from his, that practice. But this is, according to tradition, this is when King David wrote that psalm. You, God, gave me the power to move on. Okay. I was wearing sackcloth. I was in mourning. And now I'm back, in, back into life. This is the inspiration, or at least this is the story, the inspiration that is connected to that psalm. And this is what we draw, the, our inspiration, so we can go ahead and start. So I can praise you, God. I will thank you. I can praise you. The story of King David reverberates in my mind when I read that psalm. And therefore, if I'm depressed because of the loss of the temple, that's supposed to give me the inspiration. That psalm is supposed to give me the, you know, the ability to move on, to praise God. It's a transition. So now that I'm depressed because of the korbanot and I need to go into the Psalms of praise, this is the transition. Now you understand why it was brought, but why in Nusach Ashkenaz they said, you know what? In that case, let's put it in the beginning, immediately after the korbanot, because it's going to be a transition. Okay? So this is Psalm 30. So as we said in Nusach Ashkenaz, after Psalm 30, we have a Kaddish. Specifically, specifically here, page 368 in the bottom, it's a mourner's Kaddish. 
We spoke about that in the past. Why specifically a mourner's cottage? Because we said, what? No. <laughs> no. That's that's very creative. But no. Um, the rules, you know, in the in, in Atlaha, we have like rules. It's it's because it's a very similar reason, not similar, it's exactly the same reason as when we said that in Kabbalah Shabbat, right? Kabbalah Shabbat, the rabbis put a Kaddish there to separate that from the Mariv or the Torah study that takes place or whatever, right? So the, the main functionality of the Kaddish is to create separations between different units of tefillah. It could be any Kaddish almost, but what is Kabbalah Shabbat is also a public recitation of Tehillim. What is this? This is also a public recitation of Tehillim. And therefore, when we have a public recitation of the Ilim, it prompts the Horner Scottish. It doesn't have to, but that's the tradition. That's the tradition. This is why we, um, like for example, in Azkarot, right, and, and memorials and that kind of stuff, we say to the Ilim, right, when you go to, the practice is when you go to a, uh, to uh, the Matseva, you go to the Kever or somebody, right? So what is what do we do? We recite Tehillim. That's the well, that, 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 that's the traditional what do we do, right? Because later on it's going to be also a Kaddish. It's less here in Chutzlar, it's more in Israel. In Israel, the Asfarot <clears throat> happens. You go annually to the Kever and there's a recitation of that. Then you, and then you recite uh, Kaddish. Um, same goes for, this is why a lot of con congregations, for example, we don't have that custom. A lot of congregations during Yizkar include the mourner's Kaddish. We don't have that. It's not, okay? But if you want to do that, if you want to include the mourner's Kaddish, this is why you'll see in that particular practice that they included also Psalm 23 just before that because you need a public recitation of Tehillim in order to be able to do the Mourner's Kaddish. Okay? That's not the only function, but one of them. Yes? You mentioned several times the tradition changing, debate, etc. Of course. Do we have written, uh, are there written traces of this? Yeah. The, 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 the... from Rabat Rabani, they... Yeah, you just need to collect that, like in millions of books. Okay. But yeah, but all that stuff is pretty much documented. It's okay. Yeah, I'm gonna talk to you later about that. There's like the series of books that I want to recommend to you. Um. Anyway, so we have the Mourner's Scottish. Fine. Then we go into the bracha itself. Right. We open a unit. As we said. So page 370, it's Baruch Shamar. And Baruch Shamar is a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, bracha. Um, for example, a tour, um, the tour has uh, fascinating, to me at least, fascinating uh, halacha that he says that this must be sung. He said it's called Psuke de Zimra. Some of its songs. So uh, it includes the, it's not our practice, but it's interesting that he brings that to Allah that you need to actually sing it. Um, Baruch Amar acknowledges seven aspects of God creation through divine speech. Baruch Shamar Ba'ya Olam, right? So what is this reference to? That's the what we call the Ma'amarot. The story I'm going to take you back to, the story of creation. How did God create the world? God said, and therefore, something happened. Right? So that's called Ma'amarot. Ma'amar, Amar. Right? Right? So God said, and something happened. So, what are the seven aspects? Creation through divine speech. 
continual divine action and fulfillment of decrees. Baruch Omer Beose. Baruch Gozer Umekayem. God said and follow through. <laughs> it's not like, you know, you have any employees that don't follow through. No, no, no. Follow through. Gozer Umekayem. God makes a decree and it happens. Okay? And God mercy. Baruch Merachem Al Abriot. Nonetheless, there is mercy. God is merciful. Reward for those who fear him. Meshalem Sachar Tov Lireav. Right? God rewards those who fear him. God's eternal nature, that's another aspect. Chai Laad Vekayam Lanetzach. God is, is eternal. And finally, God's role in rescuing and redeeming people. And so, so I said this number six, God's role in rescuing and redeeming people. I'm plagiarizing myself here. So I'm allowed to do that. Um, <laughs> um, pode umatzil, right? God redeems me and saves and then the final was is the blessing of God's name. Baruch Shemo. So God's name by itself is a blessing. This is, by the way, it's an interesting concept. Um, when we say, or Hashem Hashem Bishmerech, Lecha Shalom. That's God's name. So, we refer to anything that is attached to God's name is automatically has that concept of bracha, of blessing in it. This is why we give bracha to our children. This is why we invoke God's name in brachot. Okay, that's the whole concept of brachot. Um, okay. So, it seems that this this particular uh, bracha, even though it's already mentioned in the Talmud, it's uh, it becomes popular and 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 finalized like the formula is finalized somewhere around uh, the ninth the ninth century, um, and the Rambam, right, just to put things in historic perspective, right, the Rambam writes the Mishneh Torah. Around 1175. Okay, I mean it took took more than a year. What is 14, 14 books? But around that time, he writes already that this was the work of Anshek Neset Abdullah. Okay, fine. Um, it's a beautiful bracha, <clears throat> and as I said. Um, right, we use what we're saying here. We're going to use the words of King David in order to praise you, God. That means in that here in that unit, which is have that in mind because it has implications. That line has a lot of implications. Um there's a, you know, a lot of ideas. There's a lot of traditions associated with this bracha. Like, for example, there's a tradition. I don't know where it is. I think it's a, it's a breita, but don't quote me on that. That says that, you know, that text kind of fell from, on a piece of paper from heaven. Okay, that's one tradition. Um, another kabbalistic idea. Um, if you count, you see that there's baruch. It's 15 times here. Parallel to the 15 steps in the Beit HaMikdash that's supposed to get you to ascend every time you say Baruch. All sorts of ideas, okay, associated with that. Right or wrong, doesn't matter. That's, that's, it's, it's cute traditions. Anyway, which takes us to the next paragraph. 
text paragraph is the what we call the Hodu, which is also very, very interesting paragraph. So this is a collection of Sukim. This is a um, collection of Sukim first from Chronicles and then from Psalms, which created again a debate. Why? Because we say, wait, when we talk about Shirei David of Decha, the songs of King David, we refer to specifically to Tehilim. We don't quote dialogues that King David has in the book of Samuel. Everybody understands that the songs of David are Tehilim. And indeed, the vast majority of this unit is Tehilim. It's all Tehilim. The word that's the songs of King. It's not only the words of David, it's the songs of David. That's a problem. Because these are not Tehilim. The first half of this, this paragraph of the Hodu collection are verses from Chronicles. Book of Chronicles. So it's again, it was a debate, okay? And make a long story short, it was added and all the traditions, all the, everybody accepted it. Why? Because at the end of the day, it is the words of King David. And um, it's not only that, it's uh, it's the words of King David in, um, um, in um uh, in his monumental speech when um he was making the preparation to um he started the project of building Beit Amikdash, collecting the money and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh Okay, then what I want you to do is to look. There's a huge difference between the Shabbat Shacharit, so we're on page 374, versus the weekday Shacharit here. Here we, we differ big time. So if you, if you look, if you look on page on page um, 64, you'll see that after that section, that Hodu section, we go into Psalm 100. Okay? I'm sorry? Ms. Moltada. We don't say it on Shabbos, I know. But we have, we're going back to Tehilim, right? But what happens here? Here we have other Tehilim. So, first point, we do not say Psalm 100 that we recite every day. Why? What is Psalm 100? Correct. So, correct. So, on Shabbat, we know that in Beit HaMgidash they brought Korbanot also on Shabbat. So you had the Tamid, Korban Tamid, right? The everyday Korban was brought, Shabbat or not, Yom Kippur, regular Tuesday, doesn't matter. So it was also on Shabbat. And then on top of that, there was also the Korban Musaf, right? The, the specific Korban that was brought on Shabbat. However, on Beit HaMikdash, these are not the only type of Korbanot that were brought. There were also what we call Korbanot Nedava. Yeah, additional donations, right? People brought all sorts of korbanot or korbanot, um, korbanot um, shlamim and certain of the chatat were brought as well, right? One type of korban is korban toda, the Thanksgiving korban. Okay, somebody wanted to say thank you to God, whatever. Today we kind of 
it's an interesting thing by itself, but whatever the, the Birkata Gomel is functions similarly to that Korban Toda today. Um, so that Korban was not brought on Shabbat. Why? Because you don't have to bring it on that day. You can bring it on Sunday. You can bring it on Friday. It doesn't have to be on that particular day. You had that flexibility. And because of that, we don't bring it on Shabbat. On Shabbat, they, they brought only the korbanot that are that have to, must be brought on that day. All the others was pushed. Okay? Otherwise, it's violating Shabbat. Right? So now, Korban Toda, Psalm 100, is the psalm that was accompanied, was recited as the Korban Toda was brought. And since the Korban Toda was not brought on Shabbat, we do not recite Psalm 100 because it is associated with the Korban Toda. Now, after that, we have Yechvod and we have Ashrei we have the Hallelujahs and we have the rest of the stuff that... Okay, but what do we have on Shabbat? On Shabbat, we have additional Psalms. So back to page 374 and you will see that you have Psalm 19 and Psalm 34 and Psalm 90 and Psalm 91, and Psalm 135, and Psalm 136, and Psalm 33, and all those Psalms, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Before Psalm 92, before I'm getting into Psalm 92, which is on page 388. So I have... What? Seven psalms added to the unit that I don't have on weekdays, just on Shabbat. Two things about it. One, we know that on Shabbat we have more time. People are not running to get to work and whatever, so... Therefore, we have more time. If we have more time, we can recite more psalms. We can be better prepared for the tefillah. The tefillah is supposed to be more spiritual, let's call it, whatever that means, okay? And therefore, this is a long, we take our time and we add material. By the way, we're going to see that also in the tefillah itself, in the Shema unit. We're going to have piyutim. We're going to have beauty in the Kedusha. All that stuff, it's because we're not in a hurry. We can take our time in praising God. So we had seven Psalms here. Seven representing the seven days of the week. Right? We had that same idea also in Kabbalah Shabbat, if you remember. Okay, it's not a random number. Okay. And if we have seven... That brings us to what? To page 388, which is Mizmor Shir Lehoma Shabbat. Yeah. You really think so? They didn't think about it. You know that you had to keep you have to keep the korban many many korban you had to keep it and watch it for like you know period of time a week a day all that kind of stuff you need to do smicha on some of the korban because you need to understand that uh, I should have been the one that you know brought on the altar um, you need to have like to develop some sort of a connection with the animal because then it's really going to hurt you. You know, that kind of stuff. You need to check the animal. There's a lot of preparation there as well. It's, it's more physical. It's more physical. Some of the korbanot were korban kapara, for sure. Some of them korban khatat, for example. Yeah. They cost. They cost. cost. And the bikurim also cost. 
Sí. No, no the same way. Not the same way. Not the same way. Um, And so we bring also, if we're all like, you know, doing that stuff, it's kind of part of the series to bring Korban, uh, Korban to bring Psalm 92 and 93, because, well, that's really talking about Shabbat. Okay, we had 92 and 93 already in Kabbalah. Shabbat, well, it says, Mizmor Shir Lioma Shabbat, it's pretty obvious. Okay. And from that point on, we continue a, uh, a series of texts, which is identical to the weekday, up until Nishmat. That's mean. So we have Yehichvod, which is the bottom of 388. And what's going on over there? That's a collection of psukim. mainly from Tehillim, and if it's not from Tehillim, it's from Chronicles, but it's still the words of David, King David, right? It's a collection of Tsukim. Then we have the Ashrei. Then we have all the Hallelujahs. And before continuing with the other stuff, I want to say a word or two about that stuff. So, why that matters? Why that matters? Because there's a hierarchy. So, as I said, historically, um, that unit was smaller. It was only Ashray. And then Psalm 150 was added. And then the one before that was added. And then the rest of the Hallelujahs were added. And then the Hodu was added. And then Yehichvod was added. And then later on by Barish David. And at the very end was Shirat Hayam. Oh, I'm sorry. And then the very, very end was Psalm 30. Why that matters? Who cares? It's still like, it's already like a matter of like hundreds of years ago that we're dealing with that. And this is the text, right? It's, it's all one unit. Not exactly. It matters because in times of need, <laughs> and that's a very loose term, we need to adjust. What does it mean? Let's assume that you were late for sure. You would never be late. Nobody, nobody's ever late to sure. But I heard of that phenomenon. Some people, I heard, sometimes it happens. And so the idea is that you're supposed to recite with the tzibu, with the kahal, with the congregation, the Shema, the Amida. Now, if you're going to go and do all that stuff now, I know I'm not talking about the way we do it. I think you really take your time. You do it with Kabana. You, you really focus on that. You do it the proper way. It takes time. Not only it takes time, you're not going to be together with a, with a congregation for when you're supposed to be. So what's the Alaha? You skip. Ah, what do I skip? Well, it depends how you late. How you late you are. And there's a hierarchy. So if you're very, very, very late, you skip everything and you do only the ashray. If you have a little bit more time, then you add Psalm 150. If you have a little bit more time, the Psalm before that. If you have a little bit more time, do all the hallelujah. There's like a whole order of things. What you skip, what you cut first. And that has to do with the history of what the, the order of the things that were added. So the older the paragraph or the psalm made it, like, you know, it's been there in the unit, you're less likely to cut it out. Okay, that, that's basically it. Now, there's one, there's one, that, that there is, you know, it's not an order, like, you know, so for example, Shirat Hayam, it's something that was added much later, and not it's, it's actually not only not all the communities have been accepted. It. So Shiratayim is one of the first things that you're going to cut, even though it's biblical. Okay, so because it's the history, but on top of that, there's another element. What type of paragraph is that? Is 
that is. So Yehichvot, for example, is a collection of psukim, and therefore, from and therefore, is in a lower status than a whole psalm. A whole psalm counts more because it's like a whole psalm; it's a chapter by itself versus a collection. The Hodu part is also a collection of verses. Oh. So you need to factor. Thank God you don't have to do that calculation. If you take uh, any book of halacha, of Hilchot Tefillah, they bring it down. The Mishnah Brura does that. Others do that. So you can you can find like the hierarchy. The 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 practical solution is not to be late and therefore and and just like you know avoid the whole thing. But no, they don't they don't do that. This is the advanced class. You want to know what to skip? You better read the how to open another book. We're not going to make it easy for you. Um, okay, so that's that. These are um, just like kind of preliminary thoughts about that. We're going to resume. Two weeks. Yeah, in two weeks, and we're going to delve a little bit more into those uh, into those uh, selections. Okay, I apologize. I got to run. Um, everybody, three weeks from today, correct? Yeah, from today, two classes, two classes. We skip two classes. <laughs>